curious, you know, be really curious about what what's beyond the four walls of your business. You know, get, go out and see what other people are doing. What are other people doing in other industries? Just be really curious about what else is happening out there. And it's, it's interesting because I think if you're the type of person that naturally does that, you find it odd that other people don't. It's kind of like, well, why wouldn't you go see what that, what's happening over there so that we could bring some of that back? But I, I think it's just not human nature for a lot of people. They're just not. But I think from a business perspective, even now more so than ever, is that to be successful, you have to be curious and keep it evolving and changing and looking forward about where things are going. Welcome to episode 216 of the industry's leading business podcast for fitness owners and managers. We'd like to thank this month's premier podcast partner, Team Rockstar Fit. Team Rockstar Fit is the mastermind team that helps fitness professionals and studios add nutrition, fitness, and online coaching to their existing business with tools from Beachbody. To find out more, visit teamrockstarfit.com. Before I introduce you to this week's special guest, I have a quick question for you all. Do you subscribe to the show? If the answer is yes, then a big gold star for you. But if the answer is no, then let me tell you why you should. Subscribing is free. It takes less than 20 seconds to enter your name and your email on the website, or alternatively, you can hit that little subscribe button on your podcast player on your phone. And most importantly, what it means is that each week, without you having to remember to check, the new episode of the show automatically gets sent to you directly. It is super easy. So if you're like me and you are committed to learning and professional development in 2019, then don't even think about it. Just go ahead and do it. Hit subscribe right now. All you need to do is go to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com or click on the subscribe button under Fitness Business Podcast on your phone's podcast player. Happy learning. I'm really excited to announce that from today, we have a new series starting. The series is called In The Shoes, and in one episode each month, I'm going to be chatting to someone in a specific role within a club. They might be the fitness manager, the franchise manager, they could be in sales or group fitness, and we're going to hear about their role, their biggest challenges, their key performance indicators, and they will share advice for others that are in a similar role. We kick off the In The Shoes series with today's special guest. She's the Chief Strategy Officer for Brick Bodies in the US, Erin Kelly. With more than 30 years in the fitness industry, Erin's career began as a fitness trainer and quickly progressed to a group exercise instructor, personal trainer, group exercise director, general manager, VP, COO, and CEO, with companies including Brick Bodies, Star Trek, Schwinn, and Les Mills. Erin's extensive experience in the industry has seen her excel in areas such as B2B sales, developing and managing high-performance teams, and executive leadership. As you're going to hear today, in her current role as Chief Strategy Officer for Brick Bodies, Erin oversees the strategic planning for the organization, including all programming, marketing tactics, and most importantly, employee engagement initiatives. So as I mentioned earlier, during the In The Shoes series of interviews, we first look at what a typical week looks like in the role. We chat about three common challenges and solutions to address them. We go through the role's KPIs and we talk about how our guest judges success both objectively and subjectively. And I also ask the question that if you could wind back the clock, what is it that you wish you knew when you first started the role? And I love Erin's answer to that question. And I think many of you will be able to relate to what she has to say. So all of that is coming up really soon. But first, a big thank you to our podcast partner. Team Rockstar Fit is a mastermind team that helps fitness professionals and studios add nutrition, fitness, and online coaching to their existing business with tools from Beachbody. To find out more, visit teamrockstarfit.com.
Enjoy this week's interview as we spend some time in the shoes of a Chief Strategy Officer in the fitness industry with our special guest, Erin Kelly. Erin, welcome along. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. To start things off, Erin, can you tell us in under two minutes, just run us through what an average day of tasks looks like for you as the Chief Strategy Officer of Brick Bodies? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, we're not a huge company, so we have four locations currently. And so under my umbrella of, Ch- of Chief Strategy Officer is programming. So everything that, that involves programming from group backs to PT to corporate wellness, all of that's one big bucket. I'm also involved very much in the marketing side of the business. So how we're, what we're doing on the programming side, how that's being represented on the on the marketing side of the business and really trying to transition and change the look and feel of the brand a bit. So we're doing a lot of brand work and innovation in that space. And then thirdly is around the people and culture part of the business. So particularly around our employee engagement side and how we're undertaking a pretty big initiative in that space too. So kind of the day in the life is a lot of different pieces and which I love because I love being involved in a lot of different things, keeps it really, really interesting. So really my day spent meeting with all of my key leaders, you know, in each of those areas. And for us kind of working side by side of how we're moving those initiatives forward. And that's kind of the daytime stuff. And then either in the morning or in the evening that I'm in the clubs, you know, just want to be where where the magic happens and actually spending time with instructors and trainers and team members and just, you know, just getting an understanding of really what's going on in the clubs, how they're feeling about things and, you know, taking part in, in the magic personally, because I think that's an important part of it too. So you got to be in there doing it. Yeah. And that's really interesting because I think that sometimes when we move into, you know, senior level management positions within a business, we can get so caught up in spending time in the office or behind the desk that we can lose touch of what's actually going on at, you know, the customer facing stuff. So I find that really interesting that you're spending time and and fantastic that you're spending time uh, in the trenches with everyone and on the ground. How many days per week would you say that you get into the gym? Is it every day that you're doing that? or how many times per week? Pretty much at least, you know, five, six days per week for sure. And maybe one of my days I, I'll, I won't make it in just because I do have a bit of a commute. So it's nice to have one day where I'm not like on the road and out and about all over the place. But, um, but yeah, I would say five to six days per week for sure. So kind of rotating around and it's nice because all of our clubs are, are not that far away from each other. So they're very accessible and I'm, I'm able to get, get to all of them pretty regularly, which is great. That's great. So can you talk us through three challenges that might arise, you know, as part of your role and then talk us through how you would address each of those challenges? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, for everyone, it's probably time. It just feels like it absolutely evaporates every day. And um, as much as, as my task list kind of looks like this of all the things I want to accomplish in a day, I always feel like I'm like, okay, maybe I got two of those checked off, you know? So it's trying to, to manage time, but also within that constantly reprioritizing, you know, what are the things that are actually going to move the business further, the fastest. And it's easy to, as, as we say, and in our world, sometimes it's like, don't be distracted by the wrong details. You know, it's like, it can, you can get very caught up in minutia and things which time suck. So it's a discipline around that, around what are the things that are going to be really productive and what are the things that are not. And I think that's something that we have to continually coach our teams on as well, because they have a ton of different things coming at them, especially at the club level that can distract them, you know, from really managing and managing the important things again, that are going to move the business forward. So that's, that's a big one. I think pace is a challenge and maybe that's more a challenge for me personally, because I like to go fast. You know, I like to move things forward quickly. And so, you know, when, in certain situations, either one, you know, if, if my pace isn't matching the pace of others, I have to adapt and, and recognize that that's the case and readjust if, if necessary so that we, we still get there in an appropriate amount of time. But at the same time, it's just pace for me. Sometimes I just want to go faster and move things faster and change things faster. I think the third thing is probably in general, just a resistance to change, you know, and it's funny in our quick fire. We mentioned that around people are really resistant to change and I love it. And then, and again, I have to recognize that most people don't feel that way. 
And so it's hard for them. So it's, again, it's that balance of bringing people along with you and getting them to believe, you know, kind of what you believe and kind of see the vision, you know, see the vision of what's possible and be able to, I think, just wrap their heads around that and get comfortable there to, to move things forward. So that can definitely be a challenge, and especially when you're more in a strategic role, you have to, you're bringing new ideas and innovations forward that sometimes it's like people just want to put the brakes on and say, whoa, like too much too soon kind of thing. So, you know, it's kind of having that restraint around that, I think. Erin, I want to circle back around to your first one, which was time, because I think that there's a lot of people that will be able to relate to this. And and, and so often we feel like we've got this never ending to-do list. And on the show before, we've had a couple of, you know, time ninja tips that we've shared with the listeners before. But in your experience, is there any advice or tips that you can share with us that you either use for yourself or with your team to prioritize? Because you're saying how important it is that we kind of make sure that we're not just working on everything all the time that we're choosing the projects or the actions, I guess, that move us forward in our business. So is there any kind of tips or tricks or advice you can give anyone that's struggling with that time issue? Yeah, I think um, a couple things. One, I think in the broader scope of businesses, we get kind of sucked in kind of in that meeting nightmare, I'll call it, (laughs) you know, where it's just meeting after meeting after meeting and not only excessive meetings, but really forcing and and have again it's more of a not forcing but more of a discipline around is this meeting actually necessary does everyone in the room absolutely have to be in this you know is there can we what can we eliminate i mean we were having like three marketing meetings a week that were an hour and a half each and it's like whoa like there's got to be a more efficient way for us to do this right so i think it's just continually looking at what you're doing on a weekly basis and are is that time spent really productive. And then also being, we've just kind of revised our whole meeting um, strategy because we did a big employee engagement survey across our team. And, you know, a lot of it came back was that we have way too many meetings and they don't feel like they're productive. And so, you know, having really clear start stop times and sticking to that because that happens a lot too in business. It's just, you know, you're getting, you're in a conversation and it just keeps going and, Oh, well, we still have three more things to cover and we're over time. Well then it's just got to stop. Sorry. That's got to move forward to the next day. So I think it's just the rigor around protecting time, you know, too, that as, as a senior executive, you have to block out time to actually have think time and productive time versus, you know, I get a lot of my time is spent with other people and spent, you know, in meetings and managing and, you know, but you need that alone time as well to really, you know, just get, get your, get your own work done and, and really have time to think and open your mind to, to other possibilities. And, you know, so I think that's important too. You need that balance, your own time versus the the actual work time. So. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I love the term that you just used of protecting time. And uh, and anyone that's come out and, and seen me present before, there's a, a particular ritual that I always talk about, which is called tiger time. And tiger yeah, yeah. time is that, have you heard of tiger time? No. So it's a ritual where basically it allows you to block out periods of time to achieve certain tasks. Um, but the way that I like to describe it is it's a time that you're fiercely protective of. And when you said that, it just, it kind of, you know, reminded me of that. And if anyone uh, wants to do a fantastic exercise in relation to this, and and when you're talking about meetings and making sure that not, you know, the entire world is invited to your meeting, um, Lisa Bedell, who was the keynote speaker at Ursa in 2019, um, she has this fantastic ritual called Kill Stupid Rules. Uh, yeah, we've yeah, that have you yeah. Yeah, brilliant book. I'll put, I'll put the link to yeah. our interview and to the book in the show notes, but uh, she basically walks you through a team exercise where you can um, go through and talk about what are all those things that are um, taking up too much time that don't make sense that, you know, that you can streamline and refine your business practices. So for anyone that, yeah. uh, that hasn't done that and if time's an issue for you, then I will put the link in the show notes for yeah, that that's great. Book. Yeah, we actually we added that question to our um, employee engagement survey that we just did. So yeah. if you could kill one stupid rule, what would you? <laughs> yeah, so it was really it was interesting the the feedback that that came back. 
So it was oh, good. And it was, it was like really random things, you know, from, cause you know, we're serving from our part-time service desk person all the way up to senior executive. So it was, it was interesting, the feedback that came back. Look, this, this wasn't part of the questions, Erin, but I'm fascinated to know. So that was one of the questions in your employee survey. Were there any others that you would recommend that people that you got a lot out of in the survey that others might be able to learn from? Any kind of standouts? Yeah, yeah let me think. Um, we asked a lot of questions around, um, uh, like, if you could perform if you could perform your position with zero defects, what would, what would it be? So it's kind of like, what are the, what are the roadblocks in your way that are preventing you from, from being your best self at work? So it was, that's always interesting too, because I think, yeah, just to see what their perception is of what are the things that are just either complete time sucks or they think are inefficiencies that maybe we've just continued to do them because we've always done them what can we remove, you know, to, to make them more productive um, and also more enjoyable, you know, at work. So, you know, that's, that's really, from my perspective, it's critical to the success of the business is that we have a really engaged team that really loves being there. And you would think, you know, in fitness, like, of course, everyone loves their job. We work in the fitness industry, <laughs> How could you right? Not? How could you not love going to work every day? You work in a health club. Yeah. Um, but, but still, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just finding that sweet spot of what really keeps teams engaged and motivated. And it's, it's, it's usually the same things, but, um, but still to, to get some clear action items out of that, of things that we were going to do differently and shift some things around to hopefully make some differences and the level of engagement of our teams. I think that's what really can move a, a, a business forward more quickly. So that is, that's a great suggestion. I love the idea of asking someone, you know, about, you know, their role and, and roadblocks in their role or what stops them from, from doing that because it really opens up conversation and it gives you so much clarity from a management perspective to really understand the challenges that that, that employee has. So thank you very much for sharing that. Erin, uh, I'm keen to understand or I'm, I'd like to talk about your key performance indicators as the Chief Strategy Officer for Brick Bodies. Talk us through some of the KPIs that you have within your role and maybe just give us a bit of an overview of how you actually judge your personal performance and you've got a lot of experience in the industry. So how do you judge your performance on a daily basis, both objectively but also subjectively? Yeah, I guess one of the, I mean, one of the big, you know, the biggest pieces around my role is around the the programming piece because when I came back to Brick Bodies again, the, the part that was, I think, most exciting for me, we know that programming is our differentiator um, within our within our group. And um, we're mid-market health clubs. We're not a boutique. We're not a budget club. We're right smack in the middle. So we have to have, that's really the only thing that's going to truly differentiate us from competition. So that's why I was brought in to help us to move that, that needle, hopefully. So the main KPIs um, that I that I look at um, to gauge my success is the level of engagement, you know, from a member perspective. So, and that's how we measure it from a performance standpoint. So what percentage of our members are actively engaged in group exercise? You know, and we're setting our benchmarks fairly high, at least compared to what I've seen in the industry, my time at Les Mills for quite a period of time. So right now as an organization, we're like at, for example, 37% group exercise engagement across our clubs, which you know, is, is good. It's not like blowing it out of the park, but you know, our goals by 2020 is to be at 50%, you know, so, and really putting the initiatives around that to get better engagement. Um, and so that's in, and that we're looking at that metric across all of our assisted exercise areas. So how are we doing with that in team training as well as personal training and rallying our team around that engagement number, because then everything kind of trends to that. So how they're, how are we doing new member orientations? How are we engaging them in assisted exercise? Because we know that that's going to keep them longer as a member. They're going to refer more members. They're going to stay longer, you know, all those things. So of course we have all the sales metrics, which is the ones that I, but for me, it's all about the programming pieces and how we're getting people engaged in that within the clubs. So that's a huge slew of metrics that from a KPI perspective that I'm looking at every single month. 
When you first got assigned that KPI, when you knew that that was such a major player in your job role, I would imagine like you were, we were just talking about you doing a staff survey, I'd imagine that there was probably a member survey conducted early on in the piece. Would that be accurate? Yeah, they have done. Well, we have ongoing surveys with members because right. that's we use um, Medallia, the right. MXM mm-hmm. surveys. And, mm-hmm. you know, so we get a ton of feedback around programming and that that continues to come through as either something that people have great things to say or if they have a bad experience they're there, it's going to be, you know, talked about as well. So, and not in a great way. So, so we get a ton of feedback through medallion. We're looking at that. I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that like obsessed, you know, to see what sort of commentary is coming through and how people are just, it, cause if they're taking the time to give that level of detail about their experiences in the clubs, that um, that one we recognize that and speak to that member about it, but then how can we take that and kind of you know apply it to just bettering the experience overall? So, what are a couple of really I don't know key insights that you've learned about your members that have helped with the direction of where you're taking the business? Yeah, I mean I think we know that our members are still looking for um, new experiences Mm -hmm. and you know we we have to continue to look just innovatively of what's going on in the industry what can we bring inside the clubs that kind of staying ahead of the trends because that's another thing with me coming into the role was that it had gotten a bit stagnant you know as far as not a lot had changed. Some of the classes on the schedule, I think, were there when I taught there like a long time ago. <laughs> so I was like, oh. So, you know, we needed a refresh. And so, and the members were telling us that. They were like, and they, it's not that they wanted to necessarily go to a boutique or go somewhere else. They wanted to stay with Brick Bodies, but they're like, we need some new refreshed programming. So, you know, I think that's important and, you know, we will, we will never be a boutique, but we can start to create those sort of environments within our facilities that create just a better member experience from the way we greet them at the door, the way we say goodbye to them when they're leaving class, how we engage with them through that interaction in the class experience. Um, but the biggest thing for, for me was that we just weren't doing enough instructor development with our team. You know, we have 150 to 160 instructors. So with that size of a team, that's not really getting the level of feedback that they need. That's not translating into great experiences inside the studios. So we're implementing a a whole instructor development program. And I, I actually, I can't take credit for the idea because Carrie Keppel gave it to me. Uh, you know, Carrie Keppel. Well, Carrie's um, been on the show before. We know Carrie. Yeah. 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 So, um, so we were talking and so they implemented kind of a whole kind of camera system within the Les Mills, one of the Les Mills locations down in Auckland that she worked in. And I was like, ah, oh. so then, you know, just having that ongoing assessment tool and building that around the growth of our instructor team so that we can, can continue to deliver better experiences. But that in combination with bringing in refreshed programming and ideas, not so it's, you know, kind of all over the map because you want it to have growth potential, but at the same time, bringing in new things in the right cadence that keeps people interested and engaged, I think is, is really, really important. So that's, that's part of the strategy as well. You uh, you have a lot of experience in the industry and I know you've got a lot of contacts in the industry. So when it comes to making sure that you're up to date with the trends and what's happening and your own professional development, who do you turn to or, or where do you go? You know, I know you and I met at, at a conference yeah. in, in 2018, so I know conference is a part of that. So yeah, where do you go for your own professional development and to learn about what's going on in the industry? Um, I mean, definitely Ursa, of course. I mean, the big ones. I really enjoy going to Cybec or FISA, you know, which is that more kind of one-on-one opportunity to meet with a lot of different partners in the industry, but then also network with, with peers across the industry around what they're doing and share best practices and that sort of thing. So that's, that's super valuable. I think it's important to also get out of the industry and see, go to different conferences that aren't inside of our industry to see what's going on there. So this year I went to the digital summit in DC, for example, you know, and that was, I mean, I had like uh, pages and pages of notes at that conference that I was like, it was really eye opening just to see all of the, the digital technology things that were happening outside of our industry, but that could be very easily brought, brought into 
to what we were doing from a marketing perspective and things like that. So I think that's really important too. And those are kind of some of my main resources that I'll go to. Okay. Any publications or any uh, Facebook pages or blogs or any, or LinkedIn pages that you might follow? Yeah. Still the club insight club business, uh, CBI magazine, you know, kind of keeping up with that club solutions is always a great resource and they're always bringing forth, I think, great information. Those are kind of two of the main ones from an industry perspective. You know, personally, I love reading um, Fast Company magazine, things like that. So I'm like, I'm always interested in kind of what's what's coming and what's new and, you know, from an innovative perspective. So that's kind what's of like changing? one of my personal things. Yeah, yeah, it's changing, exactly. It's changing. Great examples, great examples. So if you, uh, if you could wind back the clock a little bit, Erin, what do you wish that you knew when you first started in this role? I think really it's, I mean, it seems, you know, so basic, but I think it's really the importance of having really aligned, high performing people on your team, because you're only as good as the people around you. And I think oftentimes in business, sometimes we settle, you know, we, we have people either that we have loyalty to, or that have been with us for a long time. And sometimes, you know, people get to a point where they outgrow certain businesses, if they've outgrown their time and, you know, it's, those are tough changes to make. And I think, but it's critical that you do that sooner rather than later in certain circumstances. And I know in my experience in my career, I've waited too long to make those changes or waited too long to, to go in a different direction or move people around. And um, so I think that's, really critical. You know, it always comes down to the people as much as we have a lot of technological advances, things that are making us go quicker, faster, better. It still comes down to the people at the end of the day. And you really need great people to be able to execute. And I think in this industry, that's oftentimes where we fall short is in execution. And that's been my experience working with a lot of different organizations across the country. And it's just great ideas, but taking it to execution is always the struggle and you need great people to do that, you know? So it's kind of making hard choices sometimes and around, around the people, but you know, oftentimes I wish I had done that sooner rather than later. So that's actually a topic I would, I'd love to just talk about just a little bit more Erin, because I feel as though there are probably people listening that can relate to that that perhaps are trying to move their, to make some changes in the business, maybe move the business forward. But there, there may be people that aren't in the right roles or maybe are not the right people to actually work with to move that business forward. Now, that's not an easy conversation to have with someone. It's not an easy decision to make. Is there any advice that you can give to the listeners that if they do find themselves in that situation where perhaps they need to change a few players on the team, just a little bit. Is there any advice that you can give to those people in that situation? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, we're in a very emotional business and, and particularly in the programming space, as you know, so it's really important to performance manage people in a way that you can give them opportunities with, you know, good feedback around performance, how they can improve and grow so that you're not just basing it on and have data to back it up too as much as possible. So, you know, when you couple that with not only the, the behaviors, but also with the actual metrics and performance in whatever role they're in, it's important to have both because a lot of times we're, we're talking to people about performance, either one, it's just strictly based on how we're feeling about what they're doing or, and don't really have, the facts and figures to back it up. So you really kind of need both of those things to effectively performance manage people. And then when they're not meeting expectations, then they also have to be very clear about what the outcomes are. So, you know, we want to coach and mentor people and try to get the absolute best that we can from them and help to develop them into the best they can possibly be. But there's also times when it just doesn't happen. So you've got to make those hard choices to make changes. Um, and if they are not the right person for the role, then it's having those hard conversations after you've kind of gone through the steps. So at least that's the process that I, I think is fair, you know, for an individual, um, but also gives them an opportunity to learn from it too, I think. 
Yeah, I, I think that's terrific advice and in particular the, the importance of having that hard data to to take into those meetings and having those conversations so it's not a purely emotional uh, decision or conversation. It can't be. It needs to be backed up with the, the hard evidence and the data yeah. as well. So that's a really important point. Thank you. Um, yeah. Erin, to finish off with each of our interviews, we go through our fifth inspiration. And for today's fifth inspiration, can you leave us with three pieces of advice for all of our chief strategy officers out there to get better at their jobs? Yeah, I think um, the first one would be, and we, um, in our business, we call it, we practice Kaizen. So you know what that is. I do. Um, Do you want to to explain though, so everyone knows? Yeah. So it's the Japanese word for improvement and constantly improving and always looking for ways to to just improve. And mm-hmm. that requires change sometimes, which you know yeah. is hard. It's ne- um, is it never but, ending improvement. Is that the, that's what comes to my head when I think of Kaizen? Yes. That's yes. the term. Never yeah. Ending improvement, yeah. Yes. Um, so I think that's, that's critical, you know, because if you are in a strategic position, it's always looking at what can we be doing better? You know, where can we find more efficiencies? How can we get more out of out of our people. So I think, you know, that's that's really important. I would say second is be curious. You know, be really curious about what what's beyond the four walls of your business. You know, get, go out and see what other people are doing. What are other people doing in other industries? Just be really curious about what else is happening out there and it's it's interesting because I think if you're the type of person that naturally does that, you find it odd that other people don't. It's kind of like why wouldn't you go see what that what's happening over there so that we could bring some of that back? But I, I think it's just not human nature for a lot of people. They're just not. But I think from a business perspective, even now more so than ever, is that to be successful, you have to be curious and keep evolving and changing and looking forward about where things are going. And I think, you know, the third thing kind of going back to what we were just talking about before is is really surrounding yourself with the right people. I mean, you ha- that's absolutely critical to your success and um, finding the right people for the roles that you need in each area of your business to really move it forward. So, I mean, those are probably the three main things I'd say would make the biggest difference. They are great. And it's funny because I feel as though uh, they interlink together because you're talking about having the right people in the right roles. And as you've been talking, as we've done this interview over the last 25 minutes, in my head, I'm going, there, there is no better person for a chief strategy officer role than Erin. <laughs> like you are like they're well and truly like you, you clearly live and breathe this role and, and qualities like being curious and, um, and Kaizen, which we talked about that, 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 um, never an improvement, constant improvement. It's like these are things that you quite obviously live that you very strongly believe in. And to me, that makes you the perfect person to be in a strategy role. And and I think so often, as you were mentioning about, you know, people people sometimes don't want to be curious. They don't want to change. And they, because so many of us are comfortable in existing environments. You know, change can be a scary thing for so many people. So uh, I love that, you know, someone like you can have a role that you just so, so clearly are perfect for. And, and, and we really appreciate you taking the time to share that experience with us today and, and to Thank talk you. through everything that you do in, a, in your role. It's been absolutely fascinating. And I loved hearing about how there are so many elements that make up the role of a chief strategy officer. And it's not just kind of one, one focus point you know you've got your team and the HR side of things your people side of things you've got your programming which we talked about that that constant kind of look to improve the um, and your your key performance indicators so it's been really interesting uh, diving into your role today so thank you so much Aaron yeah thanks thanks Chantel it's great We'd like to thank our sponsor, OneFitStop, for their support and we highly recommend all fitness professionals go to onefitstop.com to find out how their software will enable you to take control of day-to-day management in your fitness business. OneFitStop's scheduling, client management, programming and payment collection tools will set your business up for success. Precore Quickfire 5. This week's pre-call quick five five guest is Sarah Cooperman. Hi, Sarah. Welcome along, and thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Oh, it's great to be here. 
Now, like we do with all of our guests, we're going to start things today with a pre-call, quick fire five. And can you tell everyone, why do you do what you do? Why do I do it? To get away from my children. <laughs> <laughs> the most honest answer we've ever had. <laughs> terrible. I'm a terrible person. I do what I do. You know, I'm sure everybody says because I love it, but it's, it's like, I can't think of doing anything else. You know, that, that's, what's amazing to me. I do it because it gives me joy. It re-energizes me. I think giving back actually gets you more energy and makes you, helps you feel more rewarded. So I do what I do to make money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love your honesty. This is going to be a fabulous interview. <laughs> and, oh, please. It's being recorded. It makes me really happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, what's one ritual that helps you become better at what you do? Well, I kind of figured that out pretty early on is that I have to see what I'm doing for the week on Sunday night. And I think that's really important to do because then I can feel like I have... Like I can eat the elephant one bite at a time. And what that means is I've got all these things ahead of me, but I get a little handle on what's going on. So that, that really helps me do what I do. And then we were talking a little bit earlier, and if I don't manage and my staff, and I don't mean that manage like that day-to-day, -day, you know, when did you go to the bathroom? How much of a lunch break did That's you take? Micromanagement, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I believe that leadership is, we do something, we have, um, we have weekly staff meetings, no matter what. And I am a, I'm a terrible person and I can never seem to manage these staff meetings. So I have an amazing operations director that manages it like clockwork. So one of the things that really helps me do what I do is finding people that are better than I am and are skilled at the things that I can't do. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing is just basically finding, you know, Mike, Mike Develo. He, he helps manage all the staff meetings. That, that's so key when it comes to leadership, isn't it? We've heard that from some of the very best leaders in our industry is exactly what you've just said, surrounding yourself with people that can, um, you know, support you and lift you up and fill in those gaps because we're not all good at everything, right? Yeah. So that's, that's a fantastic answer. And are there any specific apps uh, that you use to actually stay in control of your workload? Do I use any apps? Hmm. Um, Hello, Hi. iPhone. This Hi. is my life. This is our little mania, little popper. We love it. I Anybody like that. I might need to get my, my hands on one of those. Yeah. My credit cards, my driver's license, and it's my phone. And I keep my schedule on my phone. And it's not very sophisticated, but it works tremendously. And the other thing that I do that is key is that we do a nightly report for everyone on the staff. And at first, everybody kind of hated me in a very, <laughs> very not so subtle way. It's like, why do we have to do this? And then, and I, you're babysitting. I'm like, I'm not babysitting. We have to stay in communication. And if what we found is if you go to a separate site or you require them to go to a separate site to stay on task, they forget to go to the site. So we do these nightly reports where people send it to their teams or somebody else that needs to see it. And we have what they completed today and then what they have to do. And they are required to put in their own due date. So we know that if they've got something to do, they can put in their own due date. And then if they need to change it, it's very easy for them to change because it's within their control. So the communication is key and also uh, strategically, you know, it's, it's always a domino effect. Someone's got to finish this and then someone's got to finish this and then we can finish, we can start doing this and then we can start, you know, advertising it or marketing it. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic system. And I love how just naturally, and it's because of your role, uh, everything that surrounds you is team-based, isn't it? You know, it really is about the team, the team effort. I think, you know, it's interesting. I, you know that I was the Midwest distributor for Les Mills uh, for the agency in the Midwest for a decade. And I run, a, 
it, it was it became very obvious to me that we had a, a certain style and our style is incredibly collaborative it's just like probably badly that <laughs> bad collaborative like please stop talking and sharing with me okay i've heard enough about how you feel um but we all contribute and there's a lot of decisions that go on and i'm probably the first one to say oops i made a mistake or hey i'm sorry we should do let's go back and do it your way and i think that that makes people a little bit more willing to share and to take risks because they know you know if i make mistakes and i go backwards and everybody can yeah yeah. And Sarah, are there any books or blogs or podcasts or professional development materials that you absolutely love and that you would recommend to others in the fitness industry? Okay. Besides, besides, besides watching, what is it? Grey's Anatomy on Netflix. <laughs> okay. We can, totally into and i think top of the recommendation list i know <laughs> so okay now you're gonna think i'm really weird but at the end of each episode <laughs> seriously oh shut up chantel okay but at the end of each episode there's the there's these little there's these little like life lessons that come through okay. and i know it sounds odd i was not expecting that <laughs> but i do enjoy it i'm very odd i'm very strange um, the other thing I love, now this is of course more professional, but it's uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh -huh. And I love his podcast, but it's only seasonal, uh -huh. which kind of bothers I'm like, I'm like, what you're not a lot of vacation. I need you. <laughs> yeah. So then I'll listen to books on tape. Because uh -huh. yep. because I do have a dog. I love my dog. I walk with my dog and I'll listen to books that I'm embarrassed to say I never got a chance to read like Lean In, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sandberg, yeah. Yeah, Sean and, Sandberg. Mm. Yes, and it was, I like listening to the books on tape because I feel like, you know, I can't get everything I need from reading a quick e-newsletter or, you know, there's always like, I'm looking around my office, there's always a, a magazine article or a <laughs> newspaper thing that my husband throws on my desk mm -hmm constantly you know and I don't get to read enough of that stuff yeah well I here am an audible addict and um, and as we were just saying before I'm exactly the same you've got to take the dogs for a walk so you may as well learn and listen while you're doing it it's I think I think having um, audio books is one of the best inventions ever next to podcasts of course but the ability <laughs> be able to to do other things and learn at the same time I think is is such a gift so okay so the last question that we've got for these quick fire five Sarah is just give everyone a, a quick overview of the topic that we're going to be speaking about during your main interview and, and that's marketing the only job I say that I have besides being the CEO in my company is doing the marketing so when we had when we had SCW Fitness Education and Water in, Mas uh, Water in Motion and Les Mills, I had a staff of seventy eight, but I kept I kept that marketing role, and now I have a staff of I think it's almost twenty uh, for SCW and Water in Motion, and I love the marketing. And the one thing I feel pretty strongly about is building a brand, and you can have separate brands within brands. So if you start out with a certain design element, certain coloring, certain certain photos, to stick with that, kind of grow it and play around with it. Excellent. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you about this because FBP Family, I think what I love about this particular topic and, and diving into Sarah's knowledge is that this is first-hand knowledge. So Sarah has applied these things to her own business. It's years of experience and we're going to be looking at some, some unique ways that we can use marketing to, to grow our fitness business. So I'm really excited to talk about that topic, Sarah. So thank you for joining us today for the pre-call Quick Fire Five and we will see you for the main interview next week. Hey.
A quick reminder that you're all invited to the FBP family meetup on Wednesday, March the 13th at 6 a.m. If you're not familiar with our meetup walks, this is an active networking event where we walk, we talk for 45 minutes, and we return back to the main entrance of the Marriott Marquis San Diego Marina by 6.50 a.m. The meetup is free and it is an awesome way to start the day. We need to know attendance numbers, so please jump on over to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com, go to the top of the page and click on the tab called Meetup, then just register your details for the Ursa Walk. If you need any more information, please email me directly at chantal at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Thank you for joining me for this week's show. Quick reminder that all the resources and the links for today's episode can be found at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. As we come to the end of another show, I want to thank our foundation partner, Active Management. Our most downloaded shows relate to lead generation. So Active Management have an awesome free checklist for improving what is possibly your most viewed page on your website. All you need to do is grab it at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash active. Thank you so much for being part of the FBP family. As we finish off today, I want you to remember that what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into lives of others. <laughs>